Well, hello everyone, welcome to the Market Recap. I'm Jake Pelley, and today is August 12th, 2019. How's everyone doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Kids are back at school, so that means I have a little bit more sanity at my house. So hooray for sanity. As always, here's our fun disclaimer. This is being recorded, you can always get at your leisure once I post the replay. So how's everyone doing today? Looks like the market is down a little bit. So if you were lo going long into the market, well, sorry about that. Looks like we got a little bit more pain. The Dow Jones is down 1.5%. We're going to round up there. The NASDAQ down 1.2% and the S&P 500 down 1.23. You can see pretty much once again, we are looking at a sea of red with our few outliners. You see our Netflix is up a little bit. We got our uh, CenturyLink was up just a little bit. MU is catching a little bit of a bid. A little bit of green areas that you can see in the market not all entirely red but pretty much every sector taking a hit even utilities look mixed today now looking at our volume here look at this volume on briefing.com look at that NYSC volume that is light volume that is 300 million shares less than what it actually sees so that's lighter than its actual light volume, and you can see on our NASDAQ, it was actually pretty good volume. So what's going on with the NYSC? You can see right here, stocks lose more than 1%. Economic uncertainty as dampens risk continues. And then they're, they're citing Hong Kong protests and instability in uh, Italy and Argentina and lack of U.S. government trade reg uh, relations. So, hello Bill. Bill Z. Hello Donna. Hello Pierre. Good to have you all here today. Can you look at ELS? ELS. Yes, I can look at ELS. <laughs> Did you uh, click on that link about a uh, the banks now offering in the EU reverse, not reverse mortgages, interest-free loans, home loans? That's That's the start of it. For those who don't know, I posted a link earlier in chat where there are some European banks now that they are offering negative interest rates loans. What does that mean? That means if you bought a house for a million dollars and you got a negative interest rate loan, you are paying less than a million dollars back and you're not paying any interest on that loan. You're only paying principal. Not only are you paying principal, but you're also, also not paying any appreciation on that loan. Isn't that crazy? So not only are you paying less back than what you paid for, now, mind you, it's marginal. It's like a negative 1% interest rate loan. But that's still insane. We've now hit the point to where you're going to see some fringe banks start doing it, and then it's going to eventually hit mainstream. That's usually how it happens. So the bond buying in the EU has gotten so wonky by the EU standards that they're now just to push debt they are doing loans that they don't actually make money on. Now, they'll make some money on commissions. Don't get me wrong on that. But they need the debt machine to keep going. It's not about credit. It's about debt. Debt is the mover in this, in this area that we are in now in the world. So keep that in mind. Uh, TSN. T-S-N. <laughs> uh, negative interest rates pretty much said, say, you take out a loan with us, you have to pay it back less than what we you loaned from us. That's pretty much what it is. You borrow $100, you have a 1% negative interest rate loan, you pay back $99. Why is the banks doing that? Well, they just need to push debt. They need to keep liquidity capital going. They need to get that fluid in a pipe moving. And once it starts moving, well, that's a problem because credit spreads widen. You have a lot of problems once credit starts slowing down. They just need to keep the debt economy going because according to MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, it's not about borrowing that is growing an economy. It's about that debt that's created. That a debt is what's creating the economy now. And pretty much Draghi, um, the head of the Bank of Japan, I forgot his name, Kuroda. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I'll work on it, getting it right. And even 
even our Fed believes in modern monetary theory. Even the Bank of China believes in it. It's all about pushing debt. It's not about what your credit card limit is. It's that you keep using it, that you keep using that push to the economy. Now, why is this an issue? Now, why is this an issue once credit starts to slow down? It's because that debt mechanism starts to work. It stops to work. And so the Federal Reserve's essential banks will come out and they'll push rates lower and lower and lower to hopefully get people to spur getting into more credit, putting into more debt to push the economy. It doesn't matter to them if it's the dollar, the EU, the yuan, the, the real. It doesn't matter to them. It just matters that credit lines are extending the debt issued. And as that happens, you have to get people more and more interested in your into going into debt. Hey, you got you know that new car that you just got? Well, why don't you get this slightly newer car with this bells and whistles and you know what? We'll buy that old card back from you, refinance that loan, and you'll pay a lower interest rate. Or it gets bad enough to where after a while to entice a consumer to go into further debt, you have to offer them something they can't refuse. Hey, you buy that car for $1,000, you only have to pay back $990 of it. And your monthly payments are really low because the, that loan is for 10 years. So you have to entice the consumer to continue getting into debt to move the economy and we're hitting points now where everyone pretty much has everything they want everyone's in as much credit debt as they want to be in and the paychecks of most average people have been bled so dry through little bits of cuts hey hey you want that car well instead of a seven-year loan why don't we do a ten-year loan on two percent interest rates instead of five percent interest rates their paychecks have been so crushed by just these little bit of cuts that the consumer is getting tired. The consumer is not wanting to go into more and more debt, so you have to spur them going into debt, meaning that you'll see more and more naked interest rates coming more and more about. It's already a subsidy. You can do modern monetary theory as long as you own your currency. Well, you have to think about it. If I can go out and I can get an interest rate loan, say I'm Germany, and I know the Bank of E, the European Union Bank, is going to buy my bonds no matter what. They're buying a program right now where they're doing quantitative easing. I can go out and buy yield and any type of bond that I want with that excess money. Okay, you buy my negative interest rate bond, so I'm going to give you less money, and you're not going to get any interest rate from me. You're actually paying me for the privilege of holding my debt. I can go out with that excess, excess capital, and I can go buy a bond that is yielding a return. So I can go to a country like the Danish countries, and I can go and buy as many of their bonds as I want. And I can buy so many of their bonds because, remember, bonds are a teeter-totter. The more people interested in buying your debt, the less yield you have to pay. So those bonds go up in price, and those interest rates go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower until eventually they hit negative because really your bond prices are so inflated that you really don't have to offer a yield. The yield they're now receiving is the price of that bond. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, as long as you own the, your own currency, you can do monetary the, uh, the modern monetary theory. Now, Greece doesn't own their currency. Italy doesn't own their currency. Germany kind of owns the euro. This, this is all it is. Germany really has a big pull in what the EU does. France a little bit. Spain doesn't. Portugal doesn't. So they have a really hard time struggling with this debt structure. But you're probably going to be seeing more and more of these negative interest rates loans. It's just so crazy. So how does that affect the markets? Well, eventually the credit, the credit card of the consumer gets tapped. Eventually they say, you know what? I don't want to go into any more debt. And the Federal Reserves and the central banks of the world will say, okay, well, we're going to try to spark growth, whatever we can. And eventually companies are going to say, you know what? We don't really need to buy, if you're Caterpillar, we don't need to or not Caterpillar, say you're a big real estate company, we don't need to go and we don't, we don't need to buy more real estate properties. We're happy with what we need. We already have what we need in development. Okay, that, that kind of hits them there. You hit a manufacturer company that's backlogged so much inventory, they don't need to buy any inventory. They go, yeah, it's a great rate, but 
we can't sell what we have because our upfront manufacturer doesn't want to buy from us right now because he's full up. So we're going to kind of cool it off here. So eventually they're going to have a big problem in their hands. Now you're going to see a lot of people saying, well, the Fed has no more bullets left in its chamber. The ECB is in real big trouble. The, the trouble is the Fed can keep printing as much money as they want forever until the dollar goes away. They can buy back if the central bank of the Federal Reserve of the United States wants to buy all student loan debt, they could do it today. If they want to buy all the real estate debt, they could do it today. If they want to give health care to every United States citizen, they can print enough money to do it today. The problem is you depreciate your currency so much that it becomes valueless and the person can't buy bread anymore because you go to the point to where they were in um, after World War One, like Germany, where you go and try to buy a basket of bread and you're bringing a wheelbarrow full of currency into the store and while you're shoveling cash to the cash register someone steals your wheelbarrow because the wheelbarrow is what actually has value so we're seeing that kind of reverberations right now in the market you can't spur growth forever eventually your consumer gets tapped and then that's when you see real goods and services start to become almost unattainable we're not seeing that now but that's the long-term effects. And you also bankrupt bench, pension funds as well. So as every central bank right now is trying to cut interest rates to spur growth in their economies, that is bringing the, the problem of a recession. What's what they're trying to avoid? They're going to cut rates. They're going to print money and hopefully get people to buy their products. And the people are just like, eh, I don't need to buy a new car. And so you're seeing those talks right now in the economies. You're seeing that the EU is slowing down. You're seeing that China has slowed down. And you might be saying, well, Jake, China still has 6% growth. If China has 6% growth, why are they doing quantitative easing? Why have they had over three banks fail this year? One being a major bank that they actually had to bail out. That doesn't happen in an economy that's growing. A bank that extends so much credit is seeing that credit return to them should not be going bankrupt. They be, should be seeing the, their coffers expand, not deplete, and then have to get a state bailout. So we are seeing maybe the starts of it. The, then again, we're talking about a stage in which we can't really control it because this is the central banker stage. And last time I checked, if you combine the top 10 wealthiest people on earth, they still don't even compare to the balance sheet currently held by the Federal Reserve, which is $4.2 like trillion. So what does that mean for us for investors? Sorry, it's a long way of getting here. What that means is there could be recessionary forces in play. Now, whenever the market pulls back two, three, four percent, you always see these talks starting to happen more and more and more. So we have to think about it. Well, are earnings coming lighter than expected? No, companies are still reporting good earnings. Now, those earnings have been cut, their guidance quarter after quarter lower, but they're still beating these earnings expectations. The banks still look pretty relatively healthy here. So as there is a flight to safety here, you should see the market downturn, but the stocks that have good value, that they're still returning goods on their capital, they're still showing good income over sales, they could be a potential buy eventually. So you want to keep a good basket of those stocks that maybe stocks that you particularly like, keep a good watch on them, and maybe they get close to the book value, and that's when you want to pull the trigger. But you want to keep a close eye on the companies that you like, because you might be getting them at a discount. Specifically, if they're still growing earnings in a positive fashion. So keep that in mind. With that being said, let's go take a look at the overall indexes. And then we'll look at our uh, fan favorite stocks. Then we'll go take a look at oil and bonds. And then we're out for the day. That was kind of a long-winded speech there. But something you want to think about. And yes, it's been nice to return to reading. I've read a ton of books, listened to a lot of videos, talked to some economists about modern monetary theory. And they're all pretty much saying... What's crazy is all my trader friends, all the ones that are, you know, like your Annie Tanners, your Robert Kiyosaki's, all of them, when I, when I ask them questions, they're pretty much saying the same thing. Buy gold, be careful of asset classes right now. And my trader friends, the one that trade day to day, say, well, there's a good value out there every day. You just got to look for it. So just keep that in mind. Looking at the overall S&P 500, I did talk about Friday. I was real worried about going long this market. The trend is just so wonky here. And sure enough, Friday, going into today, we saw another gap down. Looking at this over trend, I would see maybe potential return to 284. Looking at the futures in the S&P 500, they are up slightly here. So keep that in mind. This is a very wonky trade. 
trading range. You don't typically see a sideways consolidating, a gap up, sideways consolidating, gap back down. These ranges are very hard to kind of determine where they want to go. Thankfully, we do have kind of a spread growing here. That 294 to 288 looks to be about the range this market wants to trade in right now. So we do have that going for ourselves. If we do pierce back below this 288, which looks like we did do so today, I would watch it for another inside candlestick right here. And if it recovers, we're moving back to 289. But it's very wonky here. Going directional in this market right now, I would probably not want in the index here, I would probably wait. I would probably wait on the ind index's short term going directional. If you are going to go long or short this market, I might. It's highly recommended that you do a, put a hedge on right now. I would not just blindly go long this market without having some downside protection, and I would not short this market without, without having some upside protection. And you can see that a lot of the big traders are also doing that. We can see that in the VIX. The VIX returning back to 21 today. The fear market, the fear index jumped right back to 20 after this weekend where it jumped down to 17. Today it jumped to 21 again. So that tells us there is some hedging going on in the market. And two, there is some volatility in this market. So if you're trying to go in, uh, if you are looking to short options here, just understand this market trend is kind of wonky here. So you don't want to do anything that's uncash secured or has a upside or downside protection not built in. So you want to look at your, like your credit spreads. You want to look at maybe your back ratio spreads. But you definitely want to have some type of secure position just in case the volatility expands because this market can really take off to the downside by one tweet. One tweet, it can send the market down another 300 points. One tweet can send the market up 300 points. Any news that China is going to come to the trade negotiating table is going to be bullish for the market. Two, if the yuan stabilizes and we see a nice pop up to the yuan, it could bring the market up higher. So you have to keep that in mind. And three, we also have a lot of European data coming out this week here. And if Europe, the Eurozone is showing effect, it is seeing some recessionary forces, the market continue, could continue to sell off here. And you can see tomorrow um, we have some Japanese data. Tomorrow we have CPI in Germany. We have the labor market in Great Britain. So you do see a couple of it. We also have Indian CPI, which that's going to be all sorts of wonky there. Um, their CPI is going to be wonky because they just cut interest rates, so just keep that in mind. You can see fixed assets for China, industrial productions. This will be an important one to look at in retail sales. So we do have some data coming out of China that you do want to keep a watch on. Now, are, is there a problem with the recession in the global market? Well, recessions are kind of natural forces, and when you try to offset recessions longer, you escalate the... the downside action that happens. It's a big anti-fragile mentality, meaning that the longer you try to make something unbreakable, when it finally breaks, it's going to break exceedingly bad. So just keep that in mind. As central banks continue to try to spur their economies, eventually it's going to get to the point to where consumers don't want to move it. And if we see that in retail sales and industrial productions, specifically for China, that's kind of propping up this world here because we have a lot of production that comes into them, be very careful. So if you are going to be shorting some options here, you want to, one, have some downside protection built into your trade because if the market ratchets down really quickly, you want to have that protection already placed in that trade because if volatility expands here, it's going to get really expensive to go out and to either close that trade or look for that protection. So if you are going to be shorting options here, um, I would not suggest any type of position that is unsecured right now for the S&P 500, just because this range is really wonky. Same when it comes to the IWM. The IWM is even wonky still. These are small cap companies that have a lot, a lot of exposure to global markets and you might say well they're small cap companies they can't really price goods in china if the united states is a small cap firm that's true but a lot of them rely on some of their production coming from outside and for them to finish these products and when there's uncertainty if i'm in a small cap aluminum ore company or a smelting company it's hard for me to determine what prices i want to place in the market for future sales in my contracts if I don't know what my competition's doing because of tariffs. 
So that's going to weigh on the industrial material sector inside the Russell. And so that could be a problem here for them. You want to keep a watch for this range. It looks like this range is still holding intact. It does look like the 152 is, or right there, sorry, the 152.50 is acting as a little area of resistance here. And it looks like this trend wants to stay right here on the Russell. And it's really wonky. This is kind of a sideways range, but we don't, we have double gaps here to the upside and back down to the downside. So be very careful of these gaps here for the Russell. With that being said, what is your stake on the, the world economy? Do you think it's slowing down? Do you think production is going to still pick up? Where do you see the economies moving? Do you think of a product in mind that could potentially keep this market going? Do you think the, what do you think is the next big tech revelation that could get people to get into debt? Be interested to know what you have to say in the chat room. Next up, looking at ELS. Okay, I, I don't think I've ever looked at this company, but let's go take a look right now. Ooh. Look at that range. That's a really nice upward range here. Uh, it's a REIT, so it pays a lot of its, um, a lot of its income goes to a dividend payment. It's net the income, so it doesn't look bad there. P.E. ratio is a little bit high. Got hit with an, a downgrade. Um, when it comes to REITs, you have to know exactly what type of REIT you're getting into. So they have 411 properties. 400 and... Oh. They have 10 employees for every one property they have. That's interesting. It's a lifetime property and leading op owner operator of manufactured home communities, RV resorts, and campgrounds in North America. And vocational occupation opportunities. Okay. So it looks like it's a. Um, it looks like it's like vacation planning homes. Okay, interesting. I like the range in it, that's for sure. Yeah, RVs and mobile homes. Doesn't look bad. Uh, the, that range looks amazing. That range looks great here. You know, Pierre, I was I was thinking that, but I didn't want to say it. I did not want to say that at all. Um, yeah, as we get a, a retirement... Now, one-third of the United States population is getting into retirement age by 2030 we will have one third of our population at retirement or past retirement past retirement being that 62 and a half cut off from social security we will have a big aging population on our hands in the next 10 years in the united states so that's not a bad place to look at it because what a lot of senior citizens like to do they like to if they're not still working because they're going to be working forever some of them they like to go. And they like to travel. So that's not bad. It's not a bad place to be here. It really took off in 2008. How long has this been around? Sorry, 2018 is when it really took off. 18. Yeah, it looks. It looks pretty parabolic though. Um, range is still holding in tight. It's breaking out of this wedge. It's been in quite some time. If it continues to break out, you're looking at the 134.16. Nice movement here. A nice upside range. Uh, the MACD is looking still pretty bullish here. The stochastics are telling us a little bit overbought, so you might want to wait for a pullback, but it's not unreasonable to say that 134 looks to be the next price target right there at the top in the Bollinger Bands. But it does look like um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this was just a long grind up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And down. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it looks like six to eight days is typically the up range it likes to move. So it could be a little bit more upside potential. And campers and RVs are very appealing. They are. Yeah, it looks like it's still continuing its up, upward move here. Let's go take a look at um, ELS. ELS uh, pays a pretty good dividend. 
If you're wondering why the dividend is so good, it's because it's a REIT. REIT pays, REITs have to pay anywhere from 70 to 90% of their income through the dividend. The, through the dividend. So 61 cents. Um, let me see here. Its earnings are kind of hard to determine. Still looks like it has pretty good earnings. Yeah, 53% implied volatility percentage. Um, we are looking like... Well, we're sitting right here in the middle of its range, so no real implied volatility is helping us. And it was about $2. Yeah, I, I would say it's a little bit overextended, but looking at its past level rises, it looks like it likes to move five to eight days to, and then see some profit taking on ELS. So I, I maybe watch for a pullback here, but definitely the 134 looks like it could be reasonable for the next target up. And then for the potential downside, I look for um, right here at the 120 uh, let's go back to wall street charts right there looks like the next level where i could pull back it's about the 129 130 right there looks like that can be the pullback range so keep that in mind els it does look a little bit overextended right now in my opinion but the stock likes to rise five to eight days in its typical range Let's see here, the best strategy you come up with. Set that load for a second. Yeah. Um, Banazka is owning the stock. Yeah, the stock looks reasonable. The volume is really low at 225,000. So it's a little bit lighter than I typically like to trade. So you're looking at a little bit of light, look, uh, light volume there. Looking at the volume right here, you can see that its average volume is uh, 600,000. So we are below its average volume right now, which is interesting. What do a lot of people like to do during the summertime? Travel. And what does this REIT do? It's a lot of travel destinations. So it's interesting to see light volume here. Uh, insider ownership, nothing of note. Yeah. So the volume in the upper range is my, be my area of caution to potentially go up here. It's going to be hard to own the stock. Uh, it's going to be hard to do options on the stock because look at that. Just because volume is so low. So keep that in mind for ELS. Hard to do options on it. Next up, let's go take a look at TSN. Then we'll look at bonds. Then we'll wrap for the day because the baby woke up from her nap. And the kids are getting crazy. You can hear them in the background right now. So, looking at Tyson Food, I believe Tyson Food just recently paired with uh, Beyond Meat, or they're doing their own type of, uh, I can't believe it's not meat burger or plant-based uh, chicken. Let's see, Plant Fire. Okay, um, still looks pretty good. Man, I would think its income would be a little bit better than those sales, but still makes some pretty good, um, still makes a profit, so that's good. Volume actually pretty good today, above average volume. So when a recession happens, what areas of the market do you want to typically look at? You look at gold, you look at bonds, you look at consumer goods that the people just have to buy. You know, your toilet papers, your toothpaste, your food items. So could be good for Tyson here for a continued bid up. Oh, okay. I mean, they have the technology. I bet you they can. Looking at the range here, how are you currently planning on trading Tyson? Um, let's see here. Hopefully they answered your question on um, ELS. Considered a long... So you want to go long Tyson. Yeah, well, if you think the market's going to unravel here, that's a good place to be. Um, typically, this is one of the good spots. Procter & Gamble, Clorox, uh, Philip Morris, the Altera Group. Uh, as long as you can hold this 86.25, looks looks like a reasonable long. If it dips below this 80, um, right here, this 86.25, you're looking at a return right there, the 84.21. You can, you know, it's interesting. If we go back to 802 and we go look at the market at 802, isn't it interesting that we had that gap down? And then if we go look at Tyson, 
we had that gap up around the same time. Let's go see if it has earnings recently. Um, it had earnings. Earnings were a miss. That's interesting. And it has a dividend coming out here on the 29th. So no real dividend risk yet. Uh, look at that dividend. Off its dividend, it went straight up, went down, went sideways, went up. So of the four dividends that we have here, one, two, and this, this should be slightly up. It does look like it kind of grinds a little bit higher after its dividend. So that's three out of the last four times. It looks like the one time it did dip lower. Let's go take a better picture. Um, dividend dip, dividend dip, dividend dip. So that's not the case at all. So no real dividend movement here because three of the past four have been slightly upward movement. And then if we could extend it further to another four dividends, it looks like it grinds down. So that kind of cancels it out. So keep that in mind. Yeah, it looks like a good potential long. I would just keep a close eye on that 89 level. It looks like it has a really hard time crossing above 90. If it does continue to rise here, you're looking at a the Bollinger Band support about a 91.80. 91.18. If we go look at the weekly, let's go take a look at the monthly. Are we currently sitting at a lifetime? We're certainly sitting at a lifetime high for Tyson Food. Interesting. So it's going to be kind of hard to determine where it can move after this, these two standard deviation Bollinger Bands. So keep that in mind. Two red candlestick days on volume, and then we saw a nice reversal. That's kind of nice here. We are a little bit overbought, so you want to keep that in mind. Looking at the price of the options, we have 54% implied volatility percentage. Uh, overall, the ranges look like, let's see here, auto zoom here. We are looking like we want to grind back a little bit higher. So you might be able to get a little bit good premium in this options here. Understand there might be a, a slight Vega risk um, if volatility does pick up. Look in the price of options, the 11 day out, uh, let's go 15 days out options. We can go 18 days too. You can sell a 91 covered call for about a buck and you can sell maybe a downside put cash you could put about the 85 so there is option ability to play here um, if you do want to play it for Tyson food it is one of the sectors that typically does well in recessionary forces so not bad not bad here for Tyson now next up let's go take a look at TLT then we'll wrap for the day here because I have to go be Mr. Dad. I gave my wife a nap. So looking at bonds here. Bonds, once again, is moving higher. Now, is there as there's going to be a flight to safety in bonds continuing from the rest of the world, bond prices will potentially keep to rising here. One thing I want you to take a note is the, it's a little bit overextended to the upside. One, two, three, four, five, six. Movement down, one, two, three. We look a little bit overextended here. Only on the situation of that we're currently sitting at. This is the monthly chart of bonds. We're currently sitting at lifetime highs. So what does that mean? That means bond prices have not been this low in yield in quite some time. That is kind of a problem for our Fed here. You can see right there, 1.48%. 1.69% right there in the Treasury. So Treasury yields look a little bit overextended. If there is a reversal in this market, be very careful in bonds. Reversal being China and United States get together and we hash out a trade deal. Well, people are going to be looking to move back into those big market caps like your Microsofts and your Apples. And bonds are most likely the ones going to get hit the hardest. So kind of be careful here. We're sitting relatively high. It does look like the 146.23 looks to be the next price target here because we're currently sitting at all-time highs. The range looks like it wants to continue to rise right there. You can see that we did break out of this previous area of resistance. So keep that in mind. Bonds, bonds still look like they want to rise here as we're getting close to lifetime highs on bond prices as bond yield continues to move down. Now say TLT looks to be a little bit too expensive for you right now and you're looking to maybe see a contraction in bond yields or see bond yields continue to uh, to move up here you can look at TBT but looking at the inverse of long long bond prices and we're looking at long bond yields you can see this one looks like it wants to break down here at 24 and if we go back and we look at a monthly time frame you can see 
As far as I can go back right now, we have never been lower in bond yields. That's even since 2008. Then again, this is not an ETF you want to hold long term. This is a ETN like product that you want to only trade for maybe a week or two and then get out of it. So keep that in mind. They want the money. That's how they do it. Remember, when bond yields are at 1.6%, Usually there's a LIBOR rate as well, and that's the interbanking lending interest rate. And so that bond yield might be a little bit higher or lower, depending on what the banks are paying each other to uh, loan money and also how much it costs there it's how much the Federal Reserve is charging them for to create money as well. So you Wells Fargo has some banking accounts where you can get three percent as well. Mind you, it's on a limit of Three hundred dollars. Uh, Goldman Sachs had like a five. I think it was a three to five percent interest rate savings account too. But you had to leave the money on deposit for like six months, and you couldn't touch it. So there's things banks can do to get higher interest rates. They say, okay, you can't touch the money for thirty days. Uh, you can't touch it for two months, or they put a limitation on how much you can put in those accounts. So when it comes to those deals, you have to um, kind of look at it. I mean, we can just look at it real quick. I mean, you can type it in real quick. Can you multiple cameras? Okay. Uh, 2%. No, it's going to be difficult with me. Okay. But that's usually the reason why. So last up, when it comes to the economy, you're going to want to watch tomorrow. You're going to watch for our retail sales and our industrial production coming out of China for the United States. Let me go back here. We do have a little bit of economic news coming out, but not too much. We have CPI, we have EIA coming out Wednesday. Really, it's going to be what's happening on with China and also the EU. Any type of news of contraction out of the EU is going to be bad for the markets. So keep that in mind. So we're looking at a little bit more of central banks actions here because well, we're well past earnings and because of that, we have to watch global banks and what happens there. I know, uh, central banks, well, we got to watch them so much, but they're going to be a big driving force in what happens on the overall major indexes. There are still good deals out there for stocks. You just have to find them. A lot of you have some pretty interesting stocks, particularly those ELS and TSN. So there are good deals still out there, but you just have to find them. So keep that in mind. So, Keep a watch for the central banks and what they plan on doing this week if economic data comes in soft. Also, you're going to be wanting watching trade news. Any type of news that comes out of China or what happens with the yuan will definitely affect our market pretty horrifically. So you want to keep that in mind. And I mean horrifically because it can either go up or down in either fashion. So keep a watch on that range that I discussed today for the S&P 500 and the IWM. With that being said, though, this is your Market Recap. I'm Jake Pelly from Wall Street Arrow. If you have any more questions, comments, concerns, I will be on the chat room for a couple more minutes as I hold this baby and try to get her um, happy. So until then, have a good rest night, everyone, and I'll see you back tomorrow.